read an article this week highlighting the 10 most significant telephone calls in history. Uh, the first call included these words, Mr. Watson, come in here. I want to see you. These were the first words ever communicated over a telephone device on March 10th, 1876 by Alexander Graham Bell. Now this call marked the beginning of an entirely new era in human communication. Things would never be the same again in how we communicated to one another. We might call Thomas Watson, Bell's assistant, the first person to ever accept a call or to receive the call. And he demonstrated receiving that call by actually showing up in the room next door where his boss, Alexander Graham Bell, was calling him from. Almost 100 years later, President Richard Nixon, he called Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong on the moon from his office in the White House. They answered, <laughs> and uh, the conclusion of that call included these words from the moon. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a great honor and privilege for us to be here, representing not only the United States, but men of peace of all nations, men with interest and curiosity, and men with a vision for the future. It's an honor for us to be able to participate here today. Again, it was marking a kind of <laughs> new frontier in the capacity to communicate a bigger story, not just Earth, but even bigger. Now, sadly, another one of these calls happened just a few years later on the night of June 17th, 1972. Sadly for Richard Nixon, this call was infamous, made by a security guard named Frank Wills, telling the police that he had found duct tape over the lock on a door in the Watergate complex. Sadly, this call set in motion a great political scandal and the disgraceful resignation of President Nixon not long later. Each of these calls represent a moment upon which history significantly turned. Each of these calls marks a moment around which things would not be the same. They would be moving somehow significantly. Now, most of the calls that you and I take in our lives are not from famous people. Often they're about pretty mundane things. But today, I want to talk about a categorically different kind of call. And that is God's call on our lives. I want to explore this together, this call that is, as Barbara and Zach have both alluded to, it's, it's a continual call, a beckoning, if you will, to move forward. So if you'd open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3, that's the story that we're going to unpack together today. And just as a heads up, if you didn't receive my email from Friday, I tried to prepare us to do this together. So it's not just me talking and you listening, but you actually thinking with me and all of us together, unpacking this story in 1 Samuel chapter 3. So I hope you've read the story already, and if not, no problem. Um, in a couple of moments, I'm going to ask you for some of your input uh, on this story. But let me set up the story first, because 1 Samuel chapter 1, 2, and 3 is a really ter terrific uh, and, and beautiful story story. So, um, but before I even do that, I want to talk a little bit bigger still about biblical calls, or that is God's call, as we see very frequently throughout the Bible. There are numerous stories of God calling someone, somebody responding. For instance, uh, you all probably know the call of Saul, also called Paul. God's call on Saul's life was very disturbing disruptive and dramatic. There was a light 
a blinding light, in fact, and Saul was knocked to the ground, completely helpless. He needed the help of Ananias, and he heard God's voice say, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Very dramatic. There are lots of other calls. If we go back even further, we would note the call of Isaiah. And when God called Isaiah, it was also quite dramatic. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, what Isaiah is seeing, the thresholds are shaking and the seraphim are singing and the smoke is filling the room and God says, who will go? And Isaiah says, well, here I am, send, send me, I'll go. If we go back even further, we would see Ezekiel, Ezekiel's call. And Ezekiel's call wasn't quite so dramatic. Ezekiel's call had a whole different nature. It was something more like a series of visions. Ezekiel saw a vision of a new temple. Uh, Ezekiel saw um, the water getting uh, up, uh, increasing. It's an invitation in this vision to go deeper, to go deeper and deeper into God. This Valley of dry bones. You may remember what Ezekiel saw, where the bones that were dead and dry began rattling and coming to life again. That was the nature of Ezekiel's call. And yet, Jeremiah's call is a whole different, has a whole different nature about it. It's more of a deep moral conviction that the world that he's living in has largely forgotten God. And he felt compelled to do something about this. So when we look at biblical calls we see that there's a wide variety of kind of the packaging that they come in. Yet, with each of those, we would find that on each of those calls, we find a significant turning of history moving forward to a new kind of arrangement of God and humanity working together. Today, we're going to look at Samuel, the story of Samuel, the call of God on Samuel's life. So, for, again, 1 Samuel is where we're looking. And um, before we look at the actual call story, I want to just briefly look at chapter 1 and 2 together because, again, I was taken away by what a, just a beautiful story it is. We're introduced at the beginning of 1 Samuel to a certain man. It starts like this. There was a certain man of Ramathaim, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. It's a specific place in a specific time and a specific man and a specific family. In fact, we're introduced to Elkanah as a descendant of four generations and a husband to two wives. Panina has children. The second wife, Hannah, is barren. She's deeply burdened. As the story unfolds, we see Hannah making a pledge to the Lord that if she would conceive she would dedicate her child to the service of the Lord for the entire life of the child, entire life of that child, even as it grew up. Well, sure enough, Hannah does conceive, and she dedicates her freshly weaned child, Samuel, to the lifelong service at the temple of the Lord. It's the back story to today's story. But it's never just that simple Biblical stories, like all great stories, are full of tension. And in chapter 1 and 2, and even a little bigger, we see that this story of Hannah dedicating Samuel is full of tension. Here's a couple of instances to point out. Hannah's going to dedicate Samuel to the service at the temple. The problem is the temple is currently being operated by a couple of corrupted brothers, Priests who were in charge, they were young, and the scripture says that they were guilty of very great sin in God's eyes because they treated the offerings of the Lord with contempt. They slept with the women who worked there in the sanctuary. These priests, Hophni and Phinehas, they were prophesied because they were so terrible, they had been prophesied by a man of God that they would be replaced by a priest a faithful priest who would do what is in God's heart and mind. Another bit of tension here is that uh, you'll hear in the opening verse of today's reading that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. It seems that people were going through kind of a dry spell on hearing from God. A third thing that's interesting, 
We get this from the tail end of Judges, which is the historical backdrop for Samuel. And that is that the ending verse of Judges says that people, people basically did what was right in their own eyes in those days. They were just, everybody was just deciding for themselves what was the right way to go. And you can imagine how the world was when that was the case. So that's the backdrop of this story of God's call on Samuel's life. So you can see we are already set up to experience this call where the story is likely to move somewhere better, to something more beautiful, something more just. A story that better reflects what is in God's heart and God's mind. That's our story today. So Zach is going to read 1 Samuel chapter 3, but I want you to be thinking, and maybe you even take a note or two. I'm interested in sharing together what you hear in this call story, the story of God calling young Samuel. Um, and I'm going to ask you at the conclusion of this reading what you hear, what you're hearing, what's unique, or what's interesting about this call story uh, in your ears today. So let's learn together. Zach, will you read for us? First yeah. Samuel 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was. Then the Lord called, Samuel! Samuel, and he said, here I am, and he ran to Eli, and he said, here I am, for you called me, but Eli said to him, I didn't call you, lie down again, so Samuel went and lie down, the Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel got up and went to Eli again and said, here I am, for you called me, but once again, Eli said, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to him, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said, To Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that have spoken against him concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God. And he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide from me, and do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. 
As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was trustworthy, a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. What a story, huh? So at this time, I'd love to hear, and for all of us to hear together, what you noticed, what stood out to you about this particular call story. So at this time, if you want to maybe push gallery view or speaker view on your Zoom and unmute yourselves when you have something to say, I would love to spend the next several minutes just hearing what you noticed about God's call on Samuel's life. One of the things that strikes me is that often when God calls, it requires two or three calls for us for it to get through our thick heads. Um, and I remember hearing, Frank, for instance, uh, I'm not imputing a thick head to David Washburn, but I remember his saying uh, how he knew that he was being called to the ministry because the call kept coming and coming and coming finally gave in. So it seems to be a characteristic, and I guess that's not so much that the Lord has to say it, but it takes three times or more for us to hear it. Excellent. Thank you, Grant, for that. Um, who else noticed something about this story? I really like the way that when Samuel went to Eli... Um, when we go to somebody about God's been really putting this on me, he's calling to me about something. Most people want to give their opinion or advice about stuff. Eli just said, go back and talk to God. I think that's really good advice. Different things stand out to me different times. I read this passage, but today what stood out to me is just the, the ultimate comfort that God knows our name. Shannon, thank you so much. I had not even thought about that, but what a beautiful recognition as Barbara mentioned a moment ago when God spoke to Jesus and last week we talked about Caden that God knows your name and calls you by name calls us by name thank you every morning in my prayers I uh, always include uh, help me to be open to receive from you whatever it is and I, I, when, when the reading was, when Zach was reading, my thought was, I uh, wonder how many times he's talked to me and I really haven't heard. Well, some of the good news about that, Charles, is that according to Grant, God will continue to call. It's quite persistent. And I see that in this story too, that God keeps calling until we respond. And I might even go a little further to say, maybe you're responding partially and you might not even be aware yet. So um, I wouldn't be too hard on yourself. Um, this is Rebecca. What I took from this was um, I was taught to pray, like, thank you God for these things and then ask God for these things. And when I grew up and he told him to just go talk to God. And so when that, happened i realized that especially everything we all are going through or me personally what i'm going through that i need to just take some time and just like talk to god like my friend thank you rebecca there's something about that time 
required to engage. And it um, doesn't have to be complicated or, or scripted. Maybe it's something even a young boy has the capacity to do, even a young boy who doesn't really understand what's happening very much. What else? Uh, Lance, this is Sharon. I also was struck by the fact that we look at Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. But then in 7, we say, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Um, I don't know. It just kind of struck me because lots of times, you know, we feel like we have to be in a certain place. Um, And we may even look at others and feel like they need to be in a certain place uh, in order to hear from God. Um, so it, that Samuel did not yet know the Lord struck me. And as you said to Charles, sometimes we're responding and don't necessarily know where we are responding because there he was lying in the temple where the ark was, which sounds really exciting place to be. (laughs) I love that Sharon. That's one of the things that stood out to me this week too, is that it would have been impossible to be more fully immersed in the culture of the sanctuary. He lived there round the clock, day and night. From the time he was very little, he literally slept across the room from the Ark of the Covenant. And yet, very clearly, one of the details is, and yet he did not know the Lord. Um, I'm thinking about, I think about a lot of things, but how many people spend a long time in the sanctuary, maybe without ever knowing the Lord? Maybe that's a little cynical. But I think, too, like you said, the... um, so Samuel lived in the temple at Shiloh. Moses was on the lamb when the burning bush called his name. The apostle Paul was on a road to Damascus where he meant to go do harm, perhaps, and God called him from that space. So great pointer. The context is an interesting place from which God calls us. What else have you noticed? Um, this is Lee here. Hey, um, I think that uh, another thing I've been thinking a lot about what Charles said about, about praying to be open to hearing God. And I think that a lot of people do feel unworthy sometimes of receiving God's, you know, call, um, because it's like, I'm not a good enough Christian, or I haven't prayed enough, or I haven't done enough. And Um, I think that, you know, like how Samuel didn't know the Lord and he still called him, um, you know, God meets us where we are. And even if we, you know, feel inadequate, that we are not inadequate in God's eyes and he will call us regardless, as long as we are open to hearing from him. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Zach, Barbara, did you have observations that haven't already been vocalized? Well, I was just taken by the word as I read it first, the first chapter and second chapter as well. Just the word trust. I think we can, you know, um, Hannah had to trust that she gave this child and he had to trust that um, he should speak to God. And Eli had to trust that, well, okay, it's God's will. I'm going to get, you know, killed. And so just that um, hearing God's word and being open to it is is awesome, but trusting that then it's okay. Hmm. I wonder... I've been thinking recently about the word trust and the word faith as synonyms. Sometimes we think of faith as a whole like body of information that we're supposed to try to make ourselves believe. But a better idea, I think, is just the capacity to trust. It's not those who hear my word. It's those who hear and then act on my word. And so that's, that, that's faith. Yeah, the capacity. Good point. Yeah, I think uh, Hannah didn't understand what was happening. Eli didn't understand what was happening. Samuel surely didn't understand what was happening. And yet Samuel acted, Hannah acted, yeah. Nice. Zach, what are your thoughts? 
Well, the other thing that stood out to me, besides just the fact that Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and yet the Lord is calling to him, is the emphasis on, at the beginning of the story, of, of how blind Eli is mm-hmm. and how there have not been any visions. And then when God shows up, he shows up speaking. And so sometimes when God calls us, I don't know, I think we can get in this idea of how God's going to show up. And if God doesn't show up that way, then we're not looking for God to show up. And, and so there's this emphasis on, or this distinction between sight and hearing as modes of communication. And so the way that God calls us each individually is not going to be the same, probably. Mm-hmm. And to be able to respond to that and, and both anticipate that God will do something different and also not be able to anticipate how God is going to show up. Yeah. So. Yeah, it seems that if we read lots of the stories of the, especially the First Testament, God talks through burning bushes and um, talking donkeys and uh, other pillars of smoke and fire and lots of different human voices, visions, impressions, convictions. Um, There are lots of details of this story which um, can really occupy some time just thinking about why, why was that detail put in that story? And the rabbis, as they would tell and meditate and retell these stories, Uh, There's loads of literature that might be unpacking just one interesting detail about this. So a whole, for instance, a whole chapter could be written on the inclusion of the detail that Eli's eyes were growing dim. Is it literally what he meant or is that figuratively? Um, We know at the beginning of the story that the, uh, the word of the Lord was rare in those days And yet in the story also, the candle or the light, the flame of God had not quite gone out yet. So these details can often be really uh, informative and and, and instructive and suggestive about parts of the story. These are great, rich stories. I noticed many of the things that you noticed and that you've already pointed out. Um, I appreciated Eli's Though he had dim eyes and he clearly did not understand, eventually he began to awaken to what God was up to. And this is the seasoned priest with a lifetime of experience, right? It's not too late even for him. So that was encouraging. Um, I also, as one of you said, I think Sharon said that the call preceded knowing. Uh, Samuel didn't know the Lord, and yet God called Samuel into whatever was unfolding. Nobody brought this up, but at the conclusion of the story, we see that part of the call was that Samuel had to speak truth to power. That's the voice of the prophet, is to tell the truth about the way the world is broken and even be part of the story of evolving to what's better and what's next. But finally, the thing I want to springboard as we kind of move towards some conclusion here today, is what comes in chapter 3, verses 19 through the first verse of chapter 4. And it has to do with the way that this call story, the way that Samuel's response ended up moving the story forward. So in chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 19... The conclusion of what Zach read went like this. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. So growing facilitates further and further uh, presence of God, maybe we could say. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. So we started the story where the word was rare. We concluded the story to where the word of God was everywhere. And it was the response of of this one call, the response of a young person who didn't understand, but slowly awakened. 
If you look at narrative time, the next thing Samuel, the next time Samuel actually does anything of note in the story is 20 years later. But there was this response that was critical in what God was doing with Israel in moving them to a better arrangement. So what? That's my final question. Why this story? And what does it have to share, to teach us today? Some of the things we've already unpacked. But I'm asking myself, what, what is God's call now on, on us, on you, on me? You see, the context of Samuel's call story feels all too familiar to the situations that we find ourselves in now in our culture. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes. And even the leading family, the father and the sons, are alleged to be full of corruption and contempt. Today's story shows us that those maybe are exactly the ingredients from which God calls us to take another step forward. And that somehow that forward movement depends on the capacity to respond, even maybe if we don't understand. This invitation to move forward. And in moving forward, just as Samuel helped facilitate the next era of the story of God and people, that you and I, in our response, will actually help facilitate the next more beautiful era of the God and human story. That by our response, that we may, like Samuel, facilitate a time where we're doing what is in God's heart and God's mind. I've been wondering recently if God is about to do something among us that would make both of our ears tingle. We're on the threshold of something big, it seems like. Inauguration is this week. The pandemic is being addressed by a vaccination. We're figuring out all kinds of new technology. What, what does it look like next? And I'm thinking of Jesus who calls us, follow me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Follow me, and I'm going to make you different. Peter, step out of that boat. I know it's turbulent. I'm hearing the Lord calling us forward, always. So I'm wondering what that next era looks like in the story of God and humanity. If I look at the big story of God and humanity throughout the ages, what I see is it just keeps getting better and better and better. And I have no reason to believe that God's continual call on us is going anywhere else besides better and better and better. So I'd like to close with us envisioning what whatever's next might look like and I'm going to borrow an image that I found from a New Testament commentator named Donna Shaper. And I want us to imagine if this is maybe where we're headed, to a world that is more just, more beautiful, and closer to what God's heart and mind are about. So if you would just close your eyes, and let's imagine what the world might look like. Imagine a world beyond gimmicks with no gotchas. A world where things are fair, where you are well, where those you love are well. Imagine a world where war colleges become art schools and weapons factories become warming centers for the elderly. Imagine a world of enchantment where you look outside at a child playing on a safe street, where good public transportation pulls up to take you to a good job, 
where economic obsession is gone and decent salaries are normal for all. Imagine a world where health is insured and life is insured and you have decent choices at the end to do what is right for you and your family. Imagine hospitals as good as homes and hospices as good as hospitals. Imagine good things and then believe that they are coming. God has plans already executed in Jesus to do good things. Look back to the scripture. Look forward in hope. Open both of your ears. Soon they will tingle. Chestnut Grove, I pray that as we respond, that we may be the people of two tingly ears as we acknowledge and help facilitate the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. Let's respond together. Would you pray with me? Oh God, sometimes these stories, which can feel kind of old and dusty, as we brush them off, they come alive in a way that offers a hope and a promise for a new world, a better chapter. A new aliveness that we've not ever even known. And I thank you for the power of your word to bring about new reality. I pray that we, whether we are like Eli or whether we're like Samuel or any others in the story, if we don't understand, I pray that nonetheless you will use us to bring about a new and more beautiful world. I thank you that it wasn't just old stories and visions and dreams that you used to speak to humanity, but that ultimately you came to live here beside us, among us, even in our own flesh. That you gave us a spirit that would never leave us or forsake us, and I pray that we would be responsive to your continual call to follow you. May we turn, repent, may we turn and see your kingdom coming. Give us courage to speak truth to power. Help us trust you that we might walk with you day by day. Thank you, God, for inviting us and calling us into this eternal relationship together for doing it so clearly in the person of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for being a part of worship this way. Uh, <laughs> we're going to continue, as Zach mentioned, for several more weeks probably to meet this way. We'll seek to make it as interactive as we can. Let me tell you about a couple of things uh, in the weeks ahead. One, two brand new connection opportunities start this week. Tonight is the beginning of a book club. My book club, will say, uh, together we'll look at faith through the lens of fiction. So the novel that we'll be reading together is called Chasing Francis. Many of you have already got it. If It's available digitally if you want to get it that way. Tonight we're going to talk about chapter one. There's a link in Friday's email. And uh, we'll join me at six o'clock for that conversation. Um, second, this coming Wednesday night, we will gather virtually um, to share our prayer, praises, prayers, and break bread together. So we're calling it uh, Evening Prayers and Communion. That will be this Wednesday evening, and we plan to do that every Wednesday evening for a while so that uh, those of you who are longing for connection will have that opportunity to get together. I think that's... Um, that, I think that's what's coming. 
One more thing, though, at the conclusion of our time together today, we're going to just leave this link open in case you want to chat with one another. You can turn on your microphone, you can turn on your camera, you can visit with one another the way that you might if we were actually able to be together live. In fact, you might even have your cup of coffee and share it with one another. But Laura is going to play a postlude in just a moment, and uh, after that postlude is when we'll invite you to interact with each other as you wish. Now, hear these words as a blessing. As we go from here, wherever we are, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence of God's Holy Spirit go with you and enliven you both now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great day. Thank you.